Okay. Good evening, everybody. Today's Wednesday night, so we're going to switch a little bit to the laws, practical laws of Purim that we need to know for tomorrow's fast day, Parsha Zachar, and um, Purim. Okay, so number one, t- tomorrow morning at the, well, in LA time, it's 540, whatever time dawn is. Dawn is 72 minutes before sunrise. So wherever you are, you can get, if you know when sunrise, it's, it's fast at 72 minutes before sunrise. So the fast is, um, it's not a very serious fast. I mean, if you're healthy, you have to fast. But uh, generally speaking, Tainus Esther is not a very severe fast because it's not mentioned openly in scriptures. But uh, you know, again, people have to fast. Pregnant nursing women, women that had babies within the last two years, they don't need to fast tomorrow. Um, in the morning davening, there's uh, it's Monday, it's Thursday, so you have the long tachnun v'hurachum. At the end of v'hurachum, you say slichas, and then you say the long gavino malkenu, then the story reading. I mean, that's just, if you're in shul, you'll just follow the minion, they'll tell you what to do. Um... Tomorrow afternoon, before Mincha, our custom is to give the half a shekel. Now, some people, if the fast day, in other words, like this, Purim is Sunday. So ideally, the fast is the day right before Purim. So Shabbos, we don't fast. And if it's not the original day, we don't fast on Friday either. So it's pushed up to Thursday. So our custom is, even when the fast day is Thursday, we still give the half a shekel before Mincha on the fast day, on Thursday. If somebody didn't uh, give it then, they can give it before Megillah reading, during the day of Purim, at night of Purim. They can give the half a shekel. Now, Chabad custom is that we give the half a shekel for, for the women and kids. Once you start giving, then you have to give every year. Okay, now the half a shekel has to be, you can't give two quarters. It has to be a currency that says on it half. So in America, we have what's called half a dollar. In uh, Israel, it would be half a shekel. In England, it would be half a pound or half a euro, whatever, you know, whatever the currency is. So you have to give the customers to give three coins. So if you don't have three coins, you go to the shoulders of Mach and shekel there with the three half a dollars. You know, you put it in dollar fifteen. You take out the three half dollars, and you know you put it back in. Now, normally on Tiny Sester in the afternoon, for Mincha there is no Tachnun or Vino Malkin because it's usually out of Purim. And out of Purim, like Arab Shabbos, we don't see Tachnun. We don't see Tachnun out of Purim either. But this year, because the fast is Thursday, so tomorrow at Mincha we do say Tachnun. We say the long Vino Malkinu. Because again, it's not out of Purim, so we have to say it. As far as Shabbos goes, it's Parsha Zohar. Okay, now for men, there's a biblical obligation to listen to the Parsha of Parsha Zohar. Whether women are obligated in it or not, bottom line is we hold women are not obligated to listen to Parsha Zohar. There are opinions that say they are obligated. Um, women lately started going to Parsha Zohar, that's fine, but again, to say they're obligated in Parsha Zohar, they're not. If a woman, though, for three years in a row went to Parsha Zohar and she wants to stop, she's going to have to be Matin Nedu. She to go to three rabbis and undo the vow because she, the fact that she did it three times in a row, she would have to nullify it if she wants to stop doing it. Okay, now Shabbos is out of Purim. Now Shabbos, you're not allowed to do any preparation for the Megillah or for Purim night. You can't be Piri Shalach Manis. Uh, you can't even bring the Megillah to Shul, even if there's an Erev. You still can't bring the Megillah to Shul on Shabbos for Saturday night because you're preparing for Shabbos for after Shabbos. Now, if you bring the Megillah to Shul, and you look in the Megillah a little bit, you read it a little bit, that's fine, because then you brought it to read it. A person who's laying the Megillah and wants to prepare the Megillah reading for after Shabbos, that is allowed because it's prayed of. 
similar to what we learned, if somebody has a Gemara test, like the Yeshiva boys usually on Sunday have a Gemara test. So if they have a Gemara test, you're allowed to learn Gemara on Shabbos, even though you're learning for the test. So why isn't that called preparing from Shabbos to the weekday? The answer is because learning Torah is learning Torah. There's no problem learning Torah. But if you have a math test or a science test, then you're not allowed to study on Shabbos for Sunday or Monday because then you're preparing from Shabbos to after Shabbos. So what many shuls are having might of later that people should be able to drive the shul for the Megillah. So again, Shabbos in LA is out at uh, 7.48, talking LA time, nobody else's time. So at 7.48, you could say, Baruch HaMavdol Ben Kodesh L'chol. So then you finish uh, Shabbos. And then you could even drive the show for Maiden and do whatever you need to do, could put on your costumes or get ready for, uh, for Maiden. Now, the obligation of listening to the Megillah is equal for men and women. Men, women, children, I mean, boys and girls over by in Bas Mitzvah for sure have to listen to the Megillah. Little kids should be brought to listen to the Megillah. In Shkhanarch, it says, Little kids that are come to show and yell and scream and disturb and not let the adults listen to the Megillah. So Shkhanach says they shouldn't be brought to show unless we have a kids program for them that they won't be disturbing the parents and other people also. Now, the Chazim, before he begins reading the Megillah, says the three brachas. When you hear the brachas of the Megillah, you do not say Baruch Hu Baruch Shmei. If you did, you according to the Alter Rebbe, it's question of your yates uh, the brachas. You just answer Amen, and then you have to listen carefully to every word of the Megillah. Okay, if you miss a word, you have to hear it again. Now, when you're following the Megillah in a printed text. Okay, you do not read along together with the reader. Okay, if you're reading from a kosher Megillah and you know the Megillah, then you can read along. Otherwise, even if you're looking in a kosher Megillah, but if you don't know the Megillah, the trop and the words, you should not read along with the Balkari because you're going to mess things up. So you listen to the Balkari. Now, what happens if somebody missed a word because of humming, banging, or whatever it is? So the then is, let's say somebody missed a word. So they have to quickly say that word and catch up to the reader. They cannot just say the word that they missed because the Megillah must be read in sequence. If you miss the word, and meanwhile the Bakari is four, letter, four words further, so that means you read that word out of order. So it wouldn't be good. So what you need to do is you can say the word that you missed, quickly read the next few words and catch up to the Bakari, and that's fine. Okay, even if it happens often during the Megillah, you're allowed to do it up to half the Megillah. Okay, so you have to be very careful when you're listening to the Megillah, you should follow it from a printed text, listen to every single word, and then you are Yetzir, uh, the reading of the Megillah. Havdalah, by the way, is said after the reading of the Megillah, not before Megillah reading. Havdalah, with very many Aish, and Psalmim, and everything is said after the Megillah reading. Why do we do it after Megillah reading? Because we want to keep Shabbos as long as possible. So therefore, we make Havdalah, the official Havdalah, we try to postpone it as much as possible. So instead of reading it, saying it before the Megillah, we say it after the Megillah. So again, after the Megillah reading, it says in Alochi, you should come home, unless you have this in the shul that you're going to, you should come home to a festive meal. It's not the meal of Purim. It says, though, Purim is a special day. It's a Yom Tadika day, besides the fact that it's Saturday night, you have what's called Malava Malka. But in addition to that, Purim night is a festive time. Okay, so then you have like this. Um, during the Purim, the 24 hours of Purim, it says in Alocha, somebody should read where the Shabbos 
garments for for Pesach, for Pesach, for Purim. Not by Pesach yet. Next week we're starting Pesach. But a person should wear Bigade Shabbos for the duration of Purim. In Maidiv, Saturday night, Mincha, Shachris, benching, you say Ala Nisan for Purim, both in davening and in benching. If somebody forgot Ala Nisan, you do not repeat the Shmon Esrei or do you not repeat the benching? Okay? If you look in the city, it will tell you all the way at the end, you should say a Rachman who Yasalonu Nisim Kamesha also love is saying by Yom Mahim. If you look in the Siddur, it'll tell you exactly what you need to say that uh, to say it at the end of benching. But if somebody didn't, they still fulfilled their obligation of of um of uh, benching and davening. Okay, next is like this. The day of Purim, by the way, I want to mention one thing like this. The mitzvah of reading the Megillah is both at night and by day. Both. You have to listen to the Megillah during, at night and during the day. Which one of the two is more important? I mean, let's say halachically, hypothetically, you can only listen to one of the two. Which one should you listen to? So the halachi is the day reading is more important than night reading. So if you can only listen to one, you listen to the day one. But halachically, you have to listen to it both times. The night one, you could do from nightfall until dawn. And the day one, you could do if you need to from dawn until sundown. You have the whole night for the night one, the whole day for the day one. But it's a mitzvah to listen to. It's one of the seven rabbinic mitzvahs. In fact, the Gemara discusses why don't we say halal and purim? On Hanukkah, we say purim. Uh, halal. Why don't we say purim? On purim, we should say halal. So the Gemara asks the question. The Gemara answers three answers. One is an interesting thing that the Megillah is the halal. We don't need to say halal because we're reading the Megillah. Another reason is because it happened outside of Israel. The miracle of Purim Hanukkah happened in Israel, the base of Migdash. Purim happened right before the building of the second base of Migdash, when the Jews were still in Golis. So Umar said, because it didn't happen in Israel, we don't say halo. And the third reason it says, because even after the story of Purim, Akata Avda Dachashver Shanan were still in slavery, we're still in Golis. Therefore, we don't say halo. Therefore, there's an important halacha. There are opinions in halacha <clears throat> that say, because the Gemara says, why don't we say halal and purim? Because we read the Megillah. What happens if somebody is in a situation where they will not have a Megillah during the day? They know they won't. The din is, according to those people, you say halal without a bracha. Because the Gemara's answer is halal Megillahs instead of halal. But if you don't have Megillah, then you should read halal. Okay, but we don't read the halal, uh, we don't read uh, halal and Purim. Okay, next as far as, oh, another very important thing. You cannot listen to the Megillah through a mechanically reproduced voice, which means you cannot hear the Megillah through a telephone. You cannot listen to Megillah on Zoom. And you cannot listen to Megillah from a microphone. And the Rebbe was very clear about it. It's clear halacha. Everybody, everybody holds that today. Those poskim in earlier generation that wrote, you could because they didn't know how the telephone worked. But according to halacha, you cannot listen to the Megillah, not through microphone, not through telephone, not through Zoom, not through a mechanically reproduced voice. Therefore, if you are happen to be in a show that reads from a microphone, if you're not close to the reader that you hear it from him, you only hear it through the loudspeaker, you are not yet to the Megillah. You have to go listen to it again.
You're not mamish, not yaitzah. And you have to do it again. Um, okay. Now there's uh, many customs in the reading of the Megillah. For instance, um, there's four psukim that everybody says out loud, the four psukim of redemption. Then the Balkari reads it again because you need to hear from a kosher Megillah. Uh, but Laila Ho, the Chazan starts reading it louder because that was their primary uh, miracle started from the when the king couldn't sleep. Uh, there's a custom, an old Jewish custom to bang Haman. Now, Chabad custom is that we only bring Haman when there's a title. Not every time the Haman, if Haman or Razer eats Saivay, if Haman or Razer, Haman ben Amdasu Agogi, like seven, eight times in the Megillah, <clears throat> that we bang Haman only when there's with a title to it, not just the word Haman. Guys were telling me in Shul tonight that the Chabad is the quickest Megillah reading of all other Shuls. I said, of course, we bang less Haman than everybody else. Everybody bangs every Haman. And we only bang uh, relatively a small amount of time, uh, times in Shul. Okay. <clears throat> um, Shachris is a regular Shachris, no Tachnu. Yad al Anisim in the Shman um, Those that didn't hear Parsha Zachar on Shabbos, can listen to the Torah reading of Pasha Zohar, I mean, but Kriya Purim in the morning, which is also Bara Molek, and they can fulfill their obligation of listening to Pasha Zohar. Our custom is that we read, listen to the Megillah while we're still wearing Rashi's tefillin. That's Chabad custom. Some people put on Rabbeinu Our custom is that we listen to the Megillah reading in Rashi's tefillin. Um, now, when the Chazim says the Shechianu on the next day, on the next morning, which is interesting, the Al Rebbe writes, we don't make Shechianu during the day. The Tzemach Tzedek writes, we do make a Shechianu during the day. And the meaning is like the Tzemach Tzedek. The Rebbe learns that it could be that Rebbe also personally did make a Shachianu during the day. When the guy reads the Megillah and he says the brachas during the day, you're supposed to have in mind, okay, the number one, the Megillah reading, you're supposed to have in mind Mishloach Manes, Matanis Yenim, the gift for the poor, and so does put him. Those are you're supposed to have in mind when you listen to the brachas during the day. One more thing I do want to mention, because this is could happen often. If somebody already heard the Megillah, and they're reading for a bunch of women, it's a group of five, six women. The women make the bracha, not the man, number one. And they say a different bracha than the men. The men make the bracha al mikra Megillah, and reading the Megillah. The women, it says in halacha, when they make the bracha, if they're reading only for women, and the guy already heard the Megillah, so the women should make the bracha lishmoya Megillah. Shekichanu b'mitzvah v'tzivanu lishmoya Megillah. Why? The men are obligated to read it, and the women are obligated to hear it. There's halachic differences between the two. Both have to hear the Megillah. But men have an obligation to read it or listen to it, which means they're reading it. Women's primary obligation is to hear the Megillah. Just in jest, because I don't want to get killed later. Somebody in my show asked me when I learned this din tonight, they said to me, I don't understand. Usually women talk and men hear. Men listen. So why, why over here do the men make the brach and saying the Megillah and the women make the brach and listening to the Megillah? So I answered him, this I didn't see anywhere, I promise you. It was made up on the spot. Because Purim is v'napechu. Everything is turned around. So on Purim, the men talk and the women hear. The women listen. Whatever. You can take it or leave it. Nothing personal. Okay, let's discuss about the mitzvahs of Purim because they're very important. And people have to know how to do it correctly. There's three mitzvahs, besides the Megillah, there's three mitzvahs of the day of Purim. 
these three mitzvahs that I'm talking about now, Megillah, you have to listen night and day. These three mitzvahs I'm talking now, you have to be doing it during the day of Purim, not at night. If you did it at night, you're not Yetzir. Okay? So what are these three mitzvahs? Mishlei Achmanis. What does Mishlei Achmanis mean? Sending edible gifts, ready to eat gifts, to one person. If you listen, if you hear, if we see the text of the Megillah, it says Mishlei Achmanis. Manais are like edibles. Manais are portions. Manais is plural. Ish each man to his friend. So therefore, the Gemara learns out what is the mitzvah mishleach manais plural. Ish only to one man it says. So therefore, you have to send two edibles to one person. Halachically, men have to send men, women have to send women. Now, families could send the families. You know that's okay. Families could send the families. It's preferred, though, some poskim write, that even if you're always sending family to family, at least one mishleach monis, a man should send to a man, and one mishleach monis, a woman to a woman. Rather than family to family, it should be specifically the man's shalach monis and, and the woman's mishleach monis. Now, what size does it have to be? Can you send a little, one raisin and one peanut? You know what I mean? It's also two edibles. So number one, there are poskin that hold it should be at least a kazayis. Each one should be an ounce, at least. And that's the way most people accept halacha. It's preferable to have one ounce of food. Now, there is a misconception that halacha brings down that there's a misconception and people think that they have to be two separate brachis. It's not true. You could send an apple and a pear. You could send fish and meat, milk, uh, uh, or fish and milk, fish and meat, or cookie, a cookie, whatever. You can send two shahakos, two mezenas, two haetas, two adamas. It has to be two separate types of food. You can't send two apples. You could send an apple and a pear. Usually we try to send Mashka and food. That's what the Rabbi used to send a bottle of mashka with the fruit. But again, it doesn't have to be liquid and and it has to be two edibles. Now, two edibles mean that there have to be ready to eat. You can't say raw chicken, send raw chicken and and uh, raw fish. Okay, and let's just send sushi, which is edible. But they have to be two edible foods that are given on the day of Mishlach Manis. They should be given on Purim and received on Purim. What happens if somebody, it's interesting, Shaila Nalocha, what happens if somebody sends it this Friday to send somebody uh, Mishlach Manis and they get it on Sunday? So they sent it on Friday. The guy got it on Sunday. Are they yates or not? The question is, is it giving the main thing or the receiving the main thing? Or if I send it on Purim and they get it a day later, am I yates in the mitzvah? So there's a machlek, if there's an argument in Allah, if you're yates in either of these two cases. Bottom line is that when a person sends Mishlech Mardes, it should be given that day and received that day and so on. Those people that send, I mentioned this every year, but it's very important. Those people that send Mishleach Manis with shuttles, you know, Purim shuttles that schools do, shows do, or institutions do to make money, practically speaking, you're not Yaitse Shalach Manis with that. It's a nice charitable thing to do. But even if you're doing a shuttle, you should make sure at least one person gets a proper Mishleach Manis. Why am I saying that? Number one, half the time the shuttles are delivered before Purim or after Purim. Whenever somebody could deliver. Sometimes they're delivered at night of Purim. That's not Yaitza. Secondly, if 50 people are give, sending one person, let's say, do you have two ounces of food for each one of those 50 people? Doubtful. So I'm not saying it's possible you could be fulfilling your obligation with it, but 
you're probably not, and therefore it would be better to send. I'm not, you should do the shuttle for sure, but you should send at least one person, one man to man, a woman to woman, to one proper shalach manis. In halachi, the Gemara tells an interesting story. Rabbi and Rab Zayra, how were they ate to the mitzvah mishleach manis? They sat down to eat the Purim Suda together and they switched the meals. Rabbi gave Rab Zayra his, Rab Zayra gave Rabbi his, and they were ate to the mitzvah mishleach manis. So you can even do it that way. There is an opinion, we don't pass on like that, though. There is an opinion that says because the Torah says, Mishloyach Monais means through a shliach. There is an opinion that you have to do it through a shliach. You have to have an, a kid or an agent sending it. But again, the Allah is not like that, even if you know you don't have any kids at home or whatever, and you give it one person straight to the other person, there's no problem. The gates of the mitzvah completely. Okay, um, that's the mitzvah Mishloyach Monais. Um Okay, one minute. That's okay. That's the mitzvah mishloach manis. But it has to be edibles. It has to be ready to eat edibles. Okay, matanis levyanim is the pasuk says again mishloach manis ish l'reyel manis is plural each man to his friend. So it's two edibles to one person. Then the pasuk says the word matanis levyanim gifts. To poor people, plural. So from there, the Gemara learns out that the mitzvah mit matonis lev yainim is to give two minimal two coins to two one coin to one poor person, another coin to another poor person. Two coins to two poor people, one each. The Rambam says, and this is brought down in Shulchan Aruch, that Hashem. Is not never happier than when poor people are given tzedakah. So it says in Aloha, by the way, interestingly, that you should do more matonis levyanim, giving money to the poor, than the mitzvah mishleach manis. Now, what happens if you live in an area where there's no poor people? So, how are you going to give matonis levyanim that day? So it says in Shonarich, he does it, he set aside the money. You designate the money and put him. You designate the money that you know this is for Matana Slavianian. And then when you find the poor person, you'll give it to them. There's another way of doing it, by the way, also. Let's say you give, I'm going to use an example. Let's say before putting, you give the rabbi money. They give him $50 and say, I want you to give it to poor people for me and put him. So then when the rabbi acts as your agent, Giving the matanis of Yenim for you and put him, that's fine. Then you did the mitzvah and put him. Because he's your agent. You're not giving him to him now. You're not giving the poor person before put him. You're giving the rabbi or whoever it is to give to the poor person and put him. So therefore, he's your agent and that's that's fine. Okay. And then the next thing is, so this put him. Is a mitzvah to have a sauda a meal on Purim. According to Aloha, you can have the sauda any time during the day. If somebody wants to make the meal in the morning, Aloha says no problem. Most people dab in mincha early and then they sit down to the sauda. The majority of the sauda of the meal should be during the day. Okay, you can't start a minute before Shkia. It's not the appropriate way of doing it. You have to start, the most of the meal should be during the day. At least a good part of the meal should be during the day. Now, it's preferred that somebody washes for bread. So, Chal, you don't need Lach Mishnah, but you should wash for Hamaitzi, for the Saudam. Also, it's appropriate to have meat. And there are opinions that say it's even preferable to have meat over chicken. Because simcha is with basa, meat. And according to many opinions, that's meat, not chicken. Somebody doesn't eat meat, somebody doesn't like meat, then they can eat uh, chicken. If somebody is a vegetarian, they can eat fish. Okay, But there is a concept of Sudhis Purim of washing and having fish 
and uh, many people eat kreplach and put him. That's you know the meat covered with the dough. Uh, you're supposed to drink a little bit more than you normally do, not to get drunk chas v'shalem. Um, and then you also have the alanisim in the benshi. Okay, so those are in a nutshell are the mitzvahs of Purim. Again, Mishlech Manus has to be before sundown. Batonus Avyenim has to be before sundown. Um, the Begillah day reading has to be before sundown. You know, all these cases that you have, people have to be careful to, to make sure to do the mitzvahs correctly. Not only that, the Rebbe wanted that whoever has the ability to influence others to do the mitzvahs of Mishlech Manus, Batonus Avyenim, it's also not a problem, it could be done. Okay, so that's basically it in the practical uh, dinim. If you want the Chabad Halacha newsletter, you can go to jewishbeverlyhills.com and then you can, um, what is the drinking limit we have in Halacha before davening? No, before davening, you're not supposed to drink. Even though there is a story with the Tzamech Sedek, Tzavach had a custom, don't, but I'm going to tell the story, but don't do this at home. Uh, the Tzavach used to have a custom of drinking a cup of water before davening. One time, but a full cup of water. One time, by mistake, it was what's called Zex and Nine Sicker, 190 proof. Not the 80 proof, but we have 190 proof. And Tzavach just drank it down before davening. Afterwards, somebody said to him, oh, Rebbe, by the way, that wasn't water. That was uh, Zex and Nines again. <laughs> Samach Sadiq said, now I understand why I daven so well. It's what Samach Sadiq said that. And he said, if I would have the opinion, ability, I would make Chassidim do it before davening. But he didn't, and we don't drink before davening. And even that, everyone, you don't, the Rebbe was emphatic about not people not getting drunk. Um, I had a call today from an overseas yeshiva. Bachir calls me. Okay, what's the obligation for Bachim and Purim? How drunk do we have to get? <laughs> but he called me. And I said to him, the Rebbe said clearly Bachim should be drunk with the wine of Chasidus. Bachim should not be the Rebbe when he made the decree about not drinking. The Rebbe said, in the, including Purim and some Chasid and everything. I told the Bachir, no drinking. You drink a little bit more than always. You say another Lachaim and that's it. He was arguing me. No, you have to get drunk. I said, no, you don't have to get drunk. The Rebbe said, the faders that Bachum should not uh, be drinking. Okay, let's go a little bit into the depth of Purim. And to show how great the Yom Tev of Purim is. And to preface it, it says in Yerushalmi, so this brings us down a lot, that when Mashiach comes, all the Yom and Tevim are not, simply means are going to be nullified, except from Purim and other places, Hanukkah also. So Chassidus explains, it doesn't mean, God forbid, that there won't be Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot anymore, or Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, because Torah is eternal, and Torah is never going to be changed. So Chassidus explains like this, and we'll understand this when we explain a little bit about Purim. Chassidus says, what does it mean that all the Yom and Tevim are going to become Bato? Bato doesn't mean nullified, non-existent. It says that Yom and Tevim is a greater revelation of godliness. It's like a lot of light, of shining godliness into the world. But when you have a infinite light and you have a, a, a light compared to the big light the little light is nothing I'll give you an example what Gemara says an expression in reference to Bedikas Chometz Shiraga Betiara Mayhani a candle in daylight doesn't do anything right if it's sunny outside and you light a candle it doesn't do anything and at night, you bring a candle into a dark room, it's going to light up the room. But it means it's like this. When Mashiach comes, there's going to be such great revelations of Kedusha that the candles, so to speak, of the Yom Tevim, the, the revelations of godliness, are going to be nullified 
compared, not God forbid it won't be, but compared to the revelation of Mashiach, it's going to become nullified. Purim is so great, Dal Rebbe explains in Torah Or. Purim is so great that evil Mashiach comes, the revelation of Purim will still be shining brightly, even though there will be this unbelievable revelation of Mashiach. So what is this Purim all about? So I'm going to make a challenge now, a Kogol challenge, where I'm going to mix a whole bunch of things together, and then hopefully we'll understand a little bit what Purim is all about. Now Rizal says, that is all right, that Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippur, that is all right, Yom Kippurim means Kippurim. Yom Kippur is like Purim. That means if you say A is like B, that means B is the primary thing, and A is similar to B. That is all says, Yom Kippurim means that Purim is greater than Yom Kippur, that Yom Kippur is Kippurim. Now, how could that be? So first of all, let's just take it from a historical point of view. When Hashem gave the Torah on Shuiz, that was the first set of Luchis. The Jews were, as Igmari uses the expression, they were coerced. Hashem held the mountain over their head, right? The Gemara says, Rashi brings it down. Either accept Torah or else I'm going to kill you. Then Yom Kippur, they got the second set of Luchas. So the Gemara says that Mikam Megdor Rabbi said, you know what? Rabbi said, you can have a bigger excuse not to keep Torah. We're forced. We're coerced. We never wanted it. You forced it upon us. You can't demand it from us. So the Gemara answers, The Jews, Kimu Kiblu Hayyuhudim, Kimu Kimu Kiblu Kvar, they accepted the title willingly, but they did a Matan title. So automatically, there's a historical connection. Purim is the second Luches, the second Matan title, so to speak, of the second tablets. And Purim is when they willingly accept the Torah. But we find a number of similarities, such as physical similarities between Purim and Yom Kippur. Number one, Yom Kippur, they cast lots, right? Which goat went La Zazel, which carbon, which goat went to, as a carbon, okay? Uh, they did a girdle, they did a lottery. Why was Purim called Purim? The Megillah says, people poured who had girdle. Haman also cast lots to know which day would be the best day to destroy the Jewish people. So Yom Kippur, they cast lots, and Purim, they cast lots. What is the, the concept of a lottery? What's unique about a lottery? Everybody knows lottery is completely irrational. There's no logic in winning a lottery. It's not that you were better, you did this, did that. A lottery is completely illogical. Purim is a day higher than intellect. And Yom Kippur is a day of lottery above intellect. Therefore, we find a very interesting connection between Purim and Yom Kippur. In the Megillah, there is no mention of God's name openly. There's acronyms, there's interpretations, like when it says Hamelech, it means Hashem. There's acronyms, Yavoy Hamelech Vahaman Hayyim is Yutke Vavke. There's uh, alluding to hints of Hashem's name, but there is no open name of Hashem in the Megillah. Why not? So Chazal tell us, because Purim was going to become a history book in the Persian community, and when people would see the name God, they would interpret it for their idols. So therefore, the simple halachic meaning, why is there no mention of Hashem in the Megillah? 
because we didn't want God's name in there because they would use it for their idols. Which means, by the way, that means it's a lower level than Hashem's name. It's a lower level. We don't want to mention Hashem's name. Yet. Purim, I'm sorry, Yom Kippur, when we were learning about Yom Kippur half a year ago, what does the Pasuk say by Yom Kippur? Ki alechem. And this day, he will forgive you. It doesn't say who. He will forgive you. Hashem Simply means before God you'll be purified. See this interprets it. Lifnei Hashem means higher than Yudke Vavke, higher than Hashem's name. That's why during the week we have three davenings. Shabbos Yom Tiv Tzvi We have four davenings because it's four levels of the soul, and only Yom Kippur. We have Ne'ila, which is the fifth level, which represents the essence of the Neshama. The name of Hashem is Yudke Vavke. There's four letters. That corresponds with the four worlds. Uh, Chachma Bina, the six Midas and Malchus. It corresponds with the various different Tfilas. It represents worlds. Yom Kippur. Why is there forgiving? We're learning this a lot when we discuss Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is higher than Yom Kippur. Chassidus explains why is there no mention of the Hashem's name in the Megillah. Not Chas because it's lower. On the contrary, it's higher than Yom Kippur. Therefore, there's no mention of Hashem's name in the Megillah because the Megillah is even higher than, than Yom Kippur. And I'll explain in a second. That's why, what is the Megillah called? Megillas Esther. Megillas Esther is a contradiction of terms. Megillah means Gilui, revelation. Esther means, as Gemara says, Anechi Aster Aster, concealment. Megillas Esther, the revelation of concealed, it's a contradiction of terms. We'll wait for that in a second. The same thing we find that Rebbe explains the Maida Ani. There's no mention of Hashem's name in Maidan. Why isn't there a mention of Hashem's name in Maida Ani? So, logically, because it's low, therefore you could say before you wash Nagalvasar, because it's not important, there's no mention of Hashem, it's not that holy. Chsidis explains why is there no Maida Ani? We know Hashem's name in Maida Ani. Because Meida Ani is the submission to the essence of Hashem. It's the relationship between essence Jew, essence God, that no purity can impurify it. And it's the same thing with Megillus Esther. What is Megillus Esther? Megillus Esther is a level of godliness which is concealed because it's too great to be revealed. And this explains a number of things that we find by Purim. What happened by Purim? Purim was an interesting type of miracle. It wasn't an open miracle, like Hashem split the sea, you know, the sea split. It was an open miracle. The miracle of Purim, to use the Hasidic language, was Nes Hamalubash Pateva. A miracle enclosed in nature. You know, I had people in my show once screaming, what's the big deal with Purim? <laughs> Esther was the wife. Mordechai, you know, see, Lahavdo between Jews was the Kissinger, so to speak. He was the, the chief of staff. So, you know what? Big deal. That was a good decree against the Jews. Mrs. Achashver uh, said, honey, honey uh, they want to kill my people. Uh, so he said, oh, man, that's terrible. Okay, it's not an open miracle like Kriyas Yamsuf or going out of Egypt or the Makis. It was a Nesam Alobish Metava. But Chassidus explains the way Chassidus interprets everything the opposite in a higher level. Chassidus explains the greatest type of miracle 
is a miracle enclosed in nature. Is the highest level of a miracle. Why? Miracle means there's nature and there's supernatural. Miracle means Hashem breaks nature. The nature of water is to flow. Hashem made a miracle. The water stood. It didn't, you know, the wall. Hashem split the sea. That's not a big deal. Because it means miracle is stronger than nature. And it broke it. There's a greater level. When there's a combination of miracle and nature simultaneously. Miracle itself breaks nature. But for supernatural to be in natural, it can't be. It's like infinite being in finite. Infinite can't come into finite. If miracle is supernatural, how could supernatural come into nature, Teva, which is natural? Teva, nature, we learned, comes in the word sunken in the sea. Why is nature called nature? Because godliness is sunken in it. You don't see godliness. You look out in the world, you see mother nature. You don't necessarily see godliness. When a miracle happens, we see godliness. Heaven is God hiding in, in nature. It's God hidden. What is a miracle? God revealed. To have a revelation of God in a concealment to combine miracle and nature, to combine supernatural and natural, or to combine infinite and finite, you need to tap in a level which is above both. Because if you're miracle, you can't be nature. And if you're nature, you can't be miracle. So how do you put nature and miracle together? How do you put infinite and finite together? How do you put spiritual and physical together? There's only one way of doing it. By tapping into such a lofty level that spiritual and physical are both equal. Miracle and nature are both equal. Infinite and finite are both equal. So what is Purim? Purim is a miracle in nature. The combination of miracle and supernatural and nature together. That is the highest form of miracle. That's higher than Yudke Vavke. Elohim is nature. Yudke Vavke means Mahava, creator, the infinite level of God. What happens, there's no mention of Yudke Vavke in the Megillah because this is not a miracle. It's not a miracle of nature, of, of miracle breaking nature. It's a combination of finite and infinite of nat nature and supernatural simultaneously. That reaches a level of lottery. That reaches the infinite level of godliness. And therefore Purim is such a great revelation of godliness that even when Mashiach comes, even when Mashiach comes, we're still going to have that revelation of Kedusha. It's not going to be like all the other Yom and Tevim. They were like a, a candle in the sunlight. It's such a powerful revelation of Godliness. What happened in Purim? That that is going to be evil when Mashiach comes. And that's why it's called Megillah Sester. What is Megillah? We said before it's contradiction of terms. Megillah means Gilui revelation. Esther means concealment. How do you have Megillah Sester? Because what is Purim? It's a level of combining both together. Megillah and Esther. <clears throat> Why? Because Purim taps into a level higher than anything else. And therefore, there's no mention of Purim in the Megillah. Uh, I mean, it's not Hashem's name in the Megillah. Therefore, Purim is lottery like Yom Kippur, which is higher than Yudke Vavke. Therefore, Yom Kippurim is Kit Purim, Purim is even greater than Yom Kippur, Darizal says. Now it all makes sense what the uniqueness of, of Purim is. 
And why Purim is such a great, the Rebbe brings on in Minhagim, that by the Rabbim, the Simcha of Purim was greater than the Simcha of Yom Taif. Because this is such a supernatural, in nature, in nature, which taps into a level which is above both together. So it's a very, very <clears throat> lofty level of Alukas. Now, what, what happened to cause that? Okay. So the Gemara says, the Gemara asks the question, why did the Jews of that generation deserve to be exterminated? How many wanted to kill? Anosh and Nosh in the top. He wanted to kill everybody. Why did the Jews merit such a terrible thing? The Gemara asks the question. The Gemara answers because Nehena Misudasai Shal Rosha. The Jews enjoyed the meal that Achashvedash made. Just to give a brief history, when the Jews, when the first base of Migrash was destroyed, the Jews were told by the Nevi'im they're going to go into Golis for 70 years. They were told by Yirmiya. Yirmiya and Navi told them you're going to go into Golis for 70 years. And after 70 years, by the way, they did rebuild the second base of Migrash. Achashvedish miscalculated the 70 years. They started counting from a different time. So in Achashvedish's calculations, of the 70 years was up, and he said, oh, 70 years are up already, the Jews are not going to rebuild the race of English. So he threw a party. That's why Achashverosh threw the party. Okay? Vashti, he was nobody. His wife Vashti was a granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar, the powerful king that destroyed the first race of English. So Achashverosh, to solidify his power, and he said, okay, the, the, we're afraid the Jews are going to go back. He said, 70 years are up. The Jews are not going back to Israel. They're not going to build the Beit Samigdosh. He threw a party. The Madras says, what did he do? He took out utensils of the Beit Samigdosh. The Kalim, Mikalim, Shainim, the Madras says, he took out vessels of the Beit Samigdosh and put them on display. And he invited everybody to the party, especially the Jews. His purpose was to show the Jews, you see, you're not going back anywhere. You're stuck. That's it. You're stuck in, 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 in under Achishvedish. And the Gemara says, and the Pasik and the Megillah, Lassis, Kitsain, Ish for Ish, Achishvedish made everybody happy. From Mordechai, he had Ish, Mordechai, and Ish Yehudi, was Mar and Ish Tavali, if Haman is called Ish, Mordechai is called Ish. Achashverosh at the party made everybody happy. Everybody was happy. You wanted uh, Hasidah Shechita, you had Hasidah Shechita. You wanted Chol of Yisrael, you had Chol of Yisrael. Whatever you wanted. You wanted Lubavitch wine, you got the Chabad wine. Whatever you wanted, you got. The food was kosher. The Gemara doesn't say that they ate treif by Sudas of Achashverosh. The Gemara's expression is they enjoyed it. And Hashem then got upset. He said, here the guy is making a party to show that you're not going to go build the base of Migdosh. And because it's for free, all the Jews ran. They didn't, they ate kosher. Umar says, Nana Misudasi. A Russia, an evil king that wants to destroy the Jews, wanted, made a party and the Jews ran to the party. And Mordechai told the Jews not to go. So the Gemara says in one statement, but this explains in the Midrash, because the Jews ran to the party of Achashvedish, that itself was the reason why, this is what the Gemara said, that's why the Jews deserved to die. Why didn't they die? Because there was a guy by the name of Mordechai. Mordechai Hatzadik. He instilled within the Jews a tremendous amount of Mesir Nefesh. 
of self-sacrifice. An unbelievable amount of Mesidus Nefesh. To the extent, the Gemara says, Amdu Kol Hashana Kula. They stood an entire year with Mesidus Nefesh. Because from the time the Gzeda was a Nisan, the, the decree was going to happen a year later in Adon, it Mamish went through a whole year from Nisan to Adon. It's a whole year. And it says that the Jews stood in Mesidus Nefesh the entire year. So this morning we're learning Exodus and Shul that this wasn't mean they stood in Mesidus Nefesh a whole year. They, there's a winter, summer, spring, and fall. Each season has its way of serving Hashem. It's a different season. Mesidus Nefesh, sometimes people and some things they have Mesidus Nefesh, other things they don't. In some places they do, some places they don't. Over here, the Chiddush was that they had Mesidus Nefesh the entire year. That means under any situation, any circumstance, <laughs> the Jews had Mesidus Nefesh. That's what Matre Atzadik instilled within the Jews, instilled within the Jews to have Mesidus Nefesh. And the Rebbe says in many Sikhs in my modern, what was the uniqueness of Matre? The Pasik says, Lo Yichra. Not only did he not bow to not bow, bow down to him to, to Haman, but he didn't even bend. The Rebbe says, What does this teach us? It's a very pr practical lesson. When it comes to aspects of Yiddishkeit, it's not enough for a Jew not to bow to Goyishkeit. The Rebbe says, we have, can't even bend down a little bit. You know, once you give in a little, what is the expression in English? You give a finger, they take the hand. Once a Jew bends a little bit from Yiddishkeit to Goyishkeit, it's already no good. Because eventually, like we learned, the Rebbe gave this marshal. You make a crack in a wall, a little crack. But the crack doesn't stay there. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until the wall falls down. The Rebbe teaches us what is the one of the main lessons from the, from the Megillah. One of the main lessons from the Megillah is instead of giving, and this relevant today with Israel, what's going on with Hamas and all those other people. Once you give in one inch to Goyishkeit, then you're already not going to win. The attitude of a Jew is lo there's not even a movement in any way whatsoever to give in to Goyishkeit. And what happens when Malchai had that goal, the guts to do it? Not only did they get rid of Haman, but as the Megillah says, Achishver said to Esther, he nay base Haman nasati Esther. He transformed Haman and he gave it over to Esther. That can only happen when a Jew is firm and strong in the Yiddishkeit. Once a Jew gives in and bends to Goyishkeit, they will never win. Then evil just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger and so on. Okay, that's it for tonight. Everybody should have a good Shabbos of Trelch and Purim. Next Wednesday night, Amir Tashem, at 8 o'clock, we're going to start the Dinam of Pesach. Three classes on Pesach, starting next Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Until then, the Trelch and Purim, everybody. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have an easy fast.